Turn your Bible this morning to Psalm 85. Psalm 85. And I want to read one verse of scripture from that psalm this morning. Psalm 85, verse 6. Psalm 85 and verse 6. Psalm 85, verse 6. Not sure who wrote this psalm. We really are not uh, uh, sure about it. But, uh, you know, many of them you'll see has, you know, a psalm of David or, or it'll name the author. But this one we're not sure about. But we can look at it and read it and study it, and we can tell whoever wrote it, they wrote it about the time they were coming back out of captivity. Uh, they'd been taken into captivity by the Babylonians. Uh, and now they were returning back, starting to return back. And it was written about this time. And, of course, the, the author sees the destruction and the things that are going on and what's happening and what's taking place. Uh, and he speaks to this and talks about that. But there's, we're going to see in verse 6, uh, even though they are getting to go back, uh, and like we're getting to go back now, you know, and come back into a symbol uh, together. And I thank God for that. Praise God for that. Yet, still, we see in verse 6, Wilt thou not revive us again that thy people may rejoice in thee? And I want to talk this morning about revival. And revival simply means bringing back to life, doesn't it? I mean, that's what it speaks to, isn't it? Getting your enthusiasm back, your love back, your zeal back, your compassion back for the things of the Lord and the things pertaining to the Lord. And he's saying, Lord, we need revival. We need revival. Can we not say that this morning as well? Do we not need revival? When you look at what's going on, just for, look at what's going on right now. The, the, the black gentleman what, that was murdered, and he was murdered. You, you know, there's nothing else you can call that. That was just plain murder. And I'm shocked that they took so long to arrest somebody over that. But look what's happened as a result of it. Did people have the right to protest? Sure they did. They sure did. That should have been protested in the way that it should have been protested. But what's going on right now isn't protesting. That's just vandalism and looting places, and destroying places. That has nothing to do with the guy's death. It's gotten to that point right now. And you see that occurring in our nation today. And so many other things that are happening. Does this country not need a revival? Does it not need turning back to God? It most certainly does. We don't need reformation. Reformation doesn't last. That's just changing things on the outside. What we need is a revival. That changes things on the inside, doesn't it? The inside of the person is what needs fixed. You fix the inside of a person, and then you don't have to worry about the outside of the person, do you? You can legislate and pass laws all you want to, but it still doesn't change the inward person, does it? See, only God can do that. Jesus can do that. He can change the inward man, and that's what we need. We need a revival. God's people need to be revived. We need to, once again, be enthusiastic concerned, compassionate about God and his work and what's going on. We've lost that along the way, haven't we? We certainly have. We need that back. I need that back. You need that back. Every church in America needs that back. Every pastor needs that back. Every person that's a member of the body of Christ needs that back. We need to be revived. And I'm going to tell you something. Revival comes from God. It's not something you can work up from within you or something you can decide on your own is going to happen. You have to call upon God and ask God to send the revival that we so desperately need. And that's what the psalmist is saying here. Will thou not revive us again that, we, that thy people may rejoice in thee? We need revival. Revival starts on an individual basis. I believe that. I believe that. It starts with individuals. That's you and that's me. And when it starts that way and people see that and you become revived, then people see that 
And I think it's just like a wildfire that starts catching and people start beginning to be revived once again and seeing how much it, this person loves the Lord, how excited they are about being a Christian, how excited they are about the God and about doing his word. And I want to talk this morning about revival on an individual basis. And first to begin with, I want you to turn to Ezra chapter 9, verses 8 through 9. Ezra chapter 9, verses 8 through 9. Again, this is just coming back from the captivity. Remember what the Babylonians did to the land. We're going to talk about that in just a moment in Habakkuk. Man, they just come in and they just ravaged, destroyed the land, the crops, everything. Now, that's what they're going back to. They've got to rebuild this, rebuild their homes, rebuild the, the temple and such like that. This is what they're coming back to. And I'm going to tell you, when you take on a task like that, you better have some kind of supernatural power, some sort of reviving, some kind of desire within your heart to want to get things done. And that's what Ezra's speaking to right here. It began first by a spiritual awakening. Nehemiah speaks of the fact of the physically building of the walls and stuff, but Ezra concerns it with a spiritual awakening. Realizing and understanding that that's the first and foremost, most important thing we need is a spiritual reawakening awareness of the things that God can do, what God has done, taking joy in that, taking joy in doing the Lord's work, rejoicing over the fact that we're a child of God. We have so much to look forward to, so many things that we can claim that are going to happen for us and God's going to do for us. He says, and now for a little space, grace hath been shown from the Lord our God. Oh, my friend, what a little grace can do, what a little grace can accomplish. You know, the Bible says that Noah found grace in the sight of the Lord. You found grace the moment you trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. God gave it to you what you didn't deserve, and that's eternal life through Him, my friend. Oh, my friend. God's amazing, amazing grace. And he says right here, to leave us a remnant to escape and to give us a nail in this holy place that our God may lighten our eyes and give us a little reviving in our bondage. For we were bondmen, yet our God hath not forsaken us in our bondage, but hath extended mercy unto us in the sight of the kings of Persia to give us a reviving, to set up a house of our God, to repair the desolations thereof, and to give us a wall in, Jude in Judah and in Jerusalem. Give us a little reviving. The psalmist in 85 said, Lord, will thou not revive us again? And as we're saying, Lord, give us a little reviving. Give us a little strength. Give us a little enthusiasm. Give us a little desire, God, to do your, do your work and the things pertaining to you. That's what we need, my friend. That's what I need. That's what you need. That's what every Christian needs in the United States of America, a little reviving. You know, these are, if you let them get to you, depressing, disturbing times, aren't they? They really are. But God wants us to rise above this. And to rejoice in him. And to be glad in him. And to be excited about the church. Listen. In spite of what's going on, the church's future hasn't changed. Not one bit. Jesus is still coming back. I don't know when, but he's still coming back. We're going to be a joint heir with Jesus one day and reign forever with him throughout all eternity. There's not anything changed about that. My friend, that should in itself be reason to rejoice and to be grateful this morning. Revive ourselves concerning that thought. Revive ourselves concerning the, the thought. Man, God has opened so many doors for us at this time to witness and to tell people about Jesus. Be focused on God's work. Spiritual matters, spiritual things which are important is what he's saying. Give us a little reviving, he says. And my friend, he did. They went back and they rebuilt. 
That wasn't done through their own resolve and willpower. That was done by that little grace that God gave them, my friend. That's what enables you. That's what sustains you. That's what strengthens you, my friend, as you go through life. The grace that comes from God. But you see, Ezra experienced it on an individual basis. That little reviving, my friend, that little spark that started right there. Realizing and appreciating God and his greatness and the promises of God and all that God's going to do. And how great it is to be a child of God, my friend. To, aim, to, to, to own and to claim Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Oh, my friend, we need a little reviving, don't we? We really do. It starts individually. We've got to be willing as individuals to be honest about ourselves and to acknowledge our sins and confess our sins. And oftentimes it's not the ones we classify as major sins that are keeping us from living the abundant life that Jesus would have us to live. It's not like, you know, where, you know, people say, well, I'm not an adulterer. I'm not a murderer. I'm not a thief. I'm, I'm none of these things. But let me ask you this. Are you a complainer? Are you a warrior? Are you a grudge holder? Those are sins as well, aren't they? They will stop you dead in your tracks and your spiritual growth just as much so as the, what we would classify the big sins. But you see, it's not the big sins that are hindering the church and individuals. It's those sins. Those sins. Just being out of fellowship with God over things that we don't see like and feel like sometimes are that big of a deal, but they are a big deal, my friend. Because what it does is it severs our fellowship with God. Those sins hinder our spiritual growth. They hinder our being able to go out and for God to use us for his honor and glory. We've got to be willing to look at ourselves honestly and acknowledge and confess the things in our life that, to God, that God's spirit is pointing out to us. Look, that is what's hindering you. Maybe it's just a bad outlook. Things aren't going exactly right. You're just having a bad day. I had to ask God to forgive me last night. I mean, it was a good day, but just, 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 you ever had one of those days just, just agitated, just everything, just, you know. Or am I the only one who ever has those kinds of days? Just, my goodness, can't point your finger on what it is. Just, my, just, you know, don't know what. God really convicted me of that. You know, just things like that. See, that, that hinders, that prevents one from growing spiritually, from being everything that God would have them to be. See, we've got to be honest. With God, remove these. God, help me to confess these things. Give me a better outlook. Give me a better attitude, God. Help me not to worry. Lord, help me to quit to, to, to holding on to grudges. Quit complaining, those kinds of things, my friend. That's what's hindering us. It's those things that we sometimes just kind of want to just kind of just sweep under the rug as not being that big of a deal, but they are a very big deal, my friend. The Bible starts individually. Individually. Each and every one of us. Look into ourselves and saying, God, I'm not all that you want me to be. God, I want to be more than what I am right now. God, I want to rejoice in you. I want to be glad in you. Can you not see the need for revival in our land and in our churches today? I think it's so obvious. Ezra says, we need a little reviving. Now turn to Psalm 138. Psalm 138. In verse 7, Psalm 138, verse 7. Now, this is a psalm of David. David wrote this psalm. It was We don't know exactly, but David was under a lot of distress. 
and a lot of, lot of persecution at various times in his life. When Saul was trying to kill him because he'd been anointed the next king or when his son rebelled against him, Absalom was trying to overthrow the kingdom from him. But we see in verse 7 here, it says, Though I walk in the midst of trouble, thou wilt revive me. Thou shalt stretch forth thine hand against the wrath of mine enemies, and thy right hand shall save me. The Lord will perfect that which concerneth me. Thy mercy, O Lord, endureth forever. Forsake not the works of thine own hands. David had confidence in the fact that God was going to revive him. Even when things were bad, when he was in war, going through times of difficulty and trouble, he says, Lord, I need that reviving. Lord, revive me. Help me to see more clearly. You know, sometimes we get, our vision gets clouded by the things of the world, the circumstances that surround us, doesn't it? And we lose our joy. Things don't go the way we think they ought to go. And everybody's like this to a certain extent. Things don't go like the way we want to go. When we get mad, we start pouting and start feeling sorry for ourselves, don't we? That's human nature. That's human nature. But look, what good does that do? Who does that help? It hurts you. It hurts people around you, doesn't it? No one's exempt from problems and heartaches and troubles and trials and bad days. And no one's exempt from that. Everybody has them. But aren't you thankful we have a God that loves us, that cares about us, that patiently works with us. And we're going to talk more about that in just a moment. Who doesn't just abandon his work, and you are his work, you're his workmanship, even when things aren't going well. And aren't you thankful, aren't you glad for those times of reviving that God gives to you? I am. To me, I've been revived this morning by just being able to come here to this church and to preach God's word. That's reviving to me. God wants you to be happy. He wants to fill your life with blessings. He wants you to have all the things according to his will that will make you prosperous in this life. Not from a material standpoint, but I'm talking about from a spiritual standpoint. We need that revival. David's saying, look, Lord, I'm in trouble. Trouble's all around about me. I need reviving. I need to be reminded who I am. Whose child I am. What my future is. What I'm supposed to be doing and should be doing. I need reviving. Ezra said, we need a little reviving. David says, Lord, I need reviving. I know you're going to revive me, God. You see, it starts individually. Now look, if you will, turn with me to Habakkuk chapter 3 and verse 2. Habakkuk chapter 3 and verse 2. chapter 3 and verse 2. Habakkuk knew judgment was coming. God said it's coming. He saw the wickedness of the people, how the nation had abandoned God, gone after other idols. He knew it was coming. He just had a problem with how it was coming. God says, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to raise up the Chaldeans. They're going to come in and they're going to ravage the land. They're going to take you captive. Habakkuk had a problem with that. Because he said, Lord, they, those people are wicked than we are. And you're going to raise them up? You're going to allow them to come in and do these things to us? And God says, yes, that's what I'm going to do. That's what I'm going to do. He knew it was coming. Bad times were coming. But he says in verse 2, 
Lord, I have heard thy speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make known. In wrath, remember mercy. Remember mercy. God, it's inevitable. It's going to happen. But God, I know, I believe you're still going to revive the work. And he's talking about the promises that he had made to that nation, to the nation of Israel, what he was going to do through them and with them. And even though it's going to look like that's completely been destroyed, he realized and understood, no, God's going to revive his work. And he did. And he did. Revive thy work. Let's read the final uh, three verses of this chapter. He's come to the realization what's going to happen, what's going to take place, and there's nothing going to prevent that from happening. But here's the thing about it. When God's Word declares it, it's going to take place. You may not agree with it, but you're not going to change it. You may want to argue about it, but you, it's futile to do that as well. So he comes to this conclusion. Well, they're coming in. They're going to destroy the land. I know that. God says they're going to. And he says in verse 17, Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines. And the labor of the olive shall fail, and the field shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the field, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. They're going to completely just rampant, just destroy this place. He knew it was, see, that's what's going to happen. He says, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will join the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength, and he will make my feet like hind's feet. He will make me to walk upon my high places to the chief singer on my string instruments. What he's saying, you know, this is going to happen, but praise be to God, I'm still going to rejoice in my God. You see, this brought about a revival in his life. Individually. With all this going on, it got him to see more clearly what's important. What's essential to get him through this was to glory and to find joy in his God to put his faith and trust in God. He says, he'll make my feet like hind's feet. Walk on my high places. Says, revival. Says, well, this all going on, God, I need reviving. Revive thy work. And he did. God did. We've already spoke to the fact that they went into captivity. When the appointed time was over, then God brought them back, didn't he? He most certainly did. Revive thy work. We as Christians this morning need to be praying, God, revive your work. What is God's work right now? What is God doing through the church? See what I'm talking about? Habakkuk was a Jew, and he was talking about the promises concerning the Jewish nation. We're part of the body of Christ. Now what's that work that's being done? The spread of the gospel. That's the work God's given us to do. That's what God is doing through the church at this particular time. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. We see that word again, not with grace. For by grace are you saved through faith. Grace, my friend, unmerited favor. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Very important to remember, that doesn't come from you. Revival doesn't come from you. You don't just decide, I'm going to revive myself, you have to ask God to revive you. There's a difference. You can't work that up, my friend. That comes from God. We've got to call upon God to send it. Just like salvation. He says in verse 9, Not of works, lest any man should boast. You can't work and earn. No, you do. You deserve salvation, my friend. It comes by the grace of God. It comes from heaven. The God-man, Jesus, born of a virgin, 
lived a holy, perfect, sinless life, died on the cross for our sins. And through his death, we can obtain forgiveness of those sins by what? By faith in him. By grace through faith. Can't earn your way to heaven. Don't deserve to go to heaven. It's a gift of God. Grace. And he says in verse 10, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Habakkuk said, Revive thy work in the midst of the years. Well, what's God's work for you? What's God doing with us and through us right now? Promoting the gospel of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that begins individually, doesn't it? I believe that it does. You've got to be willing to say, God, what is it in my life that's displeasing? What is it in my life, God, that's hindering me, that's preventing me from being the kind of Christian I need to be, the kind of husband or wife I need to be, the kind of friend I need to be, the kind of employee I need to be? What is it in my life, God, that's hindering me? Reveal it to me, God. Show it to me. Give me the grace and the power, God, to overcome. I can't do it on my own. I'm looking unto you. God, I want to be a part of your work. I want you to continue working in my life. We've got to be willing to pray that prayer and to open up our heart. And let God do his work. Let God do his work. We are his workmanship, as he says. Not us. Him. That's the problem. It's not about what I can do. It's about what God can do through me. See, oftentimes people think, what can I do? Well, the best thing you can do is to surrender to God and let God work through you. Because what you think you should be doing or could be doing may not be what God thinks you should be doing or could be doing. You see, that's the problem. That's the problem. I read an illustration one time of someone who was praying about, you know, God, show me your will for my life. What would you have me to do? But God, I really think I'd be of much better use to you in an advisory capacity. See the point I'm trying to make? See, people want to tell God what they should be doing instead of letting God tell them what they should be doing. We've got to be willing to say, God, here I am. Use me for your honor and glory. It's not about what I want. God, it's about what you want. That's what revival's about. That's what revival is submitting, yielding to the will of God. That's what it's about. Because that's the only place, the only time in your life you can be truly, genuinely blessed and happy is when you're allowing God to work in your life and you're doing what God would have you to do. The Bible begins individually. Everybody would agree with me. Every Christian would agree that we need revival. Everyone would say, yes, we need revival. We do need revival. This country needs revival. The church needs revival. But it starts individually. Individually with individuals. You know, it's easy to look at somebody else and say, boy, I'll tell you what, so-and-so needs to straighten up. They need to quit talking about people. They need to quit visiting these certain places. They need to quit uh, using these certain kind of words. They need to quit doing this. They need to quit doing that. I'll tell you what, old so-and-so needs to straighten up. And our, I'm, I'm, I'll con I'm convinced there'll be somebody can say the same thing about you. But how, what's that going to benefit us? Just like the preacher's up preaching one time, preaching a sermon, and someone said, Amen, preacher, lay it on them. They need to hear it. They need to hear it. See the difference? They need to hear it. No 
No, what we need to do is look at our own life and say, God, you show me. Where am I wrong? Where do I need to straighten up? God, help me quit making excuses for who I am or what I am and blame it on something or someone else. God, you show me what I need to do. Because, God, I, don't, I want revival. You can say I want revival, but are you willing, really, to yield and submit and let God have his way? See, I think what the problem's been with the church for many, many years is we want revival, but we want it on our terms. We'd like to be revived. We weren't on our terms. No, we've got to just say, Lord, it's on your terms. God, here I am doing what you will. Show me, God. Mold me, shape me, work me. God, help me to quit resisting. I'm being against your molding and working in my life and doing what you would have me to do. That's what revival's all about, isn't it? I'm believing it is. It's more than just feeling, you know, really rejoicing and being happy. And that's part of it. That's a byproduct of it. And salvation of souls is a byproduct of it. And when you have a genuine revival, you'll have many people come to know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. But revival again begins by God's people getting revived. Then that's when you see these other things begin to happen. When God's people get revived and experience revival. We need revival. I need revival. The church needs revival. And only one way we can get revival, God must send revival. We need to pray that God send us a revival. No stipulations, God. No time frame. No conditions. God just send us a revival. We've got to be willing to pray that prayer. God, we need revival. God, send us a revival. And be willing to say, Lord, let it start in me. Let it start in my life, in my heart. Would you be willing to pray that prayer this morning? And if you're listening and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, God loves you. Jesus loves you. God wants you to be part of the body of Christ. God wants to give you the promises he's given to those who trust his son as Lord and Savior. Eternal life through him. But it comes by grace through faith. But really, when you think about it, doesn't everything come by grace through faith? Have we any strength or power to do anything on our own? We don't, do we? It all comes by grace through faith. That's why it says without faith it's impossible to please God. Because through your faith that's where God can channel that grace into your life. God, we need more grace, more power, but that comes from Him. God is speaking to your heart anyway this morning as we pray. Whether it's just say, Lord, I want revival to start in me. God, I need to be saved. Whatever it is, as we pray this morning, I pray that you would ask God at this time as we pray, Lord, thy will be done. Thy will be done. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, we come to you this morning thanking you and praising you, Lord, once again for just blessing us so much, being so good to us, allowing us to come back to your house to worship again today. God, I need revival. God, the church needs revival. This land needs revival. God, we know that it only can come through you. God, we just must yield and submit and continue to pray, God, and ask you, Lord, to give us that little revival. Send that revival, God. Extend that grace to us, God. Move in our hearts and our lives. Continue your work, Lord. And we'll praise you. We'll thank you, God. If there's anyone here today, God, that's heard this message or someone out there that can be listening to this message that doesn't know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, God, I pray today would be the day they'd say, God, I believe. I believe Jesus died for my sins. I acknowledge I'm a sinner. I invite him to come into my heart and life and to save me, God. All these things we ask in Jesus' name. 
Amen. God bless you. Good to see you this morning. Praise God for your presence.